Hello, everyone. Good afternoon, wherever you are. And I am joined by Dr. Robert Zubrin on this Monday. Um, so thank you so much for joining us today. I actually haven't talked to you since the summertime and we're still not on Mars. <laughs> so we're, we're making progress with that. Um, I like this first comment. This man has made me fall in love with Mars. So you're an inspiration to many uh, with your commitment to advocacy and envisioning what our future will look like on Mars. Um, so let's talk about, first and foremost, Starship. We had a launch uh, exactly a month ago today on November 18th. Hard to believe that it's already been a month. Um, and this was the second Starship test flight. I'm sure that you watched it. So what'd you think of it? Well, obviously it was progress compared to the first flight. And, uh, you know, uh, if you look at uh, SpaceX, um, Falcon 1 uh, failed the first three times, though each time it got further into the flight envelope. Uh, it succeeded on the fourth flight. Falcon 9 succeeded on its first flight, but the uh, development of being able to land it failed uh, five times before they succeeded, though each time got closer. Uh, the uh, Starship uh, upper stage landing it I believe succeeded on the fifth try. Uh, and Musk's uh, methodology is to uh, build a lot of them, launch them, fly them, crash them, figure out what went wrong, fix that, push further into the flight envelope until he encounters the next failure mode and um, crash it and then push further. So my guess on this one, he's now had uh, two failures. Uh, I think he'll probably have one more failure, and I, I I think he'll succeed on number four. That's that's my my bet. But it could be number three, it could be number five, but whether it's number five or number six, uh, it, it's going to happen. That that's how this thing works. So, um, and the approach is a very good one uh, because if you compare that, uh, you know NASA with SLS. Okay, it succeeded on the first flight, but you know when that program was started? 1988. Okay, okay. I myself, uh, as a young-ish engineer, was actually on the preliminary design team of what is now called SLS at Martin Marietta, which then later became Lockheed Martin, in 1988. It took them 34 years. And in aerospace, cost is people times time. Uh, if, if you take uh, 30 years to do something, it's going to cost you five times as much as if you did it in six years. Uh, and so, um, I mean, the hardware cost is the smallest part of it. It's the paying people is the cost. And um, so this is how Musk does it. Uh, he just dives right into it. He doesn't spend years and years analyzing things. Uh, I mean, compare this to New Glenn. It has yet to fly. Um, and uh, uh, Blue has been in business as long as SpaceX, and they've yet to reach orbit, okay? And uh, well, they were supposed to launch today and they had to scrub, unfortunately, but this would be their first mission in 15 months. It's crazy. Right. And, but furthermore, that's just a suborbital mission, right? Right? Um, <laughs> the, the, the uh, the new Shepard, uh. Well, I, I don't know the statistics of it, but it's it doesn't even get to orbit. No. And uh, the, and orbit is what counts here. And uh, so, yeah, if you want to get above the atmosphere, you could do it in a high altitude balloon, too. Uh, and uh, really, um, but it's, um, you know, so they can say they haven't had a, well, uh, certainly haven't had a failure of a orbital vehicle because they haven't had an orbital vehicle but the uh uh so this is this is it this is how you this is the efficient way to proceed right well and i want to go back to what you were saying you think that perhaps starship will fail one more time and succeed on the fourth try when you talk yeah. about failure what what are you talking about what would be considered a failure on the next attempt in your opinion well i mean look the uh, well, first of all, they're not even trying the full flight envelope. They're going, if this succeeds, 
it will make it into orbit, go once around the Earth, and then come down and do a soft landing in the Pacific Ocean. That is, they're going to be as if it was landing. You know, they're going to decelerate, you know, and and if there actually had been a landing pad out there in the middle of the ocean, they would land on it. But they're not going to, but they're doing it on the ocean. So in case anything goes wrong, it won't hit anything. Uh, so that's the goal of this mission, to do, uh, to get into orbit, go once around, and essentially come down soft as if they were landing on a patch of ocean out there near Hawaii someplace. Uh, and that would be a full success. So here on this mission, okay, the launch looked a lot better than the first one. Um, and not just because they didn't rip the pad to pieces and send debris flying in all directions. <laughs> that debris flying in all directions also damaged their own engines. Right. Uh, uh, this one, uh, and then they got the staging to come off, uh, but they didn't make it to orbit. Uh, and so I think I, my guess is the next one, the Starship will actually make it to orbit, but it will not successfully re-enter and soft land. And something's going to go wrong with that part. So the, the, they'll find out what went wrong with that. And then the next one after that will do its soft landing put down on the ocean. So that's why I'm saying number four. But, you know, uh, they'd be exceptionally lucky to make it all the way through all of that on the next uh, flight, but I think the flight after that, and it, maybe it'll take two flights after that. But right. I think uh, 2024 is the year that Starship makes orbit. Absolutely, I would hope so. And hey, we have some uh, quite a few people tuning in, some generous listeners. Bimmer Geezer with a $50 super chat. Thank you so much. He says, I hope you get the information for which you are looking, and thank you so much for sharing your giant brain, Dr. Zubrin. And another super chat from Michael Maxey, $20. Thank you. And this is a good segue. Uh, Dr. Zubrin, what is your opinion to give the new estimate on when Starship will be viable? Well, as I say, I think they will have a successful test flight in 2024. Uh, and I think they'll use it to deliver real payloads to orbit in 2025 and also land it, uh, uh, you know, truly land it safely and recover it. Uh, and so then I would say it's probably going to be fully operational doing frequent flights to orbit in 2026. Now, here's the thing. Uh, okay, if Starship makes orbit, and I believe it will in 2024, that will change people's entire perception of the space enterprise. And in particular, if we have a new president, like let's say Nikki Haley upsets Trump, takes the nomination and wins the election. In my view, this is the best of all possible worlds. You have a new president who really wants to do something. And uh, if Starship's a reality at the point that she enters the White House, she's gonna say, look, here's this cat that wants to go to Mars. He's got the ship. If we got together with him, could we have people on Mars by the end of my second term? And the answer is gonna be yes. Uh, and is it going to cost a trillion dollars? No, we could probably do it within NASA's existing budget because he's got the ship. It's a lot of other little stuff that's needed. We need a power system for Mars. We need the system to make the propellant on Mars. We need Mars spacesuits, Mars vehicles. But we could probably develop that part within our existing budget and put it together with his flight capability and let's do Mars. Uh, and, and she'll say, well, then why not do it? Why not? Why? What, what? What? What are we waiting for here? So, if 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 Starship becomes a reality in 2024, and if we have a new president in 2025, I think we're looking at humans to Mars by 2032. Okay, because I listened to your mooned out conversation, and you said unless Starship doesn't work for some reason, you you may think 2040s. Well, okay. Look, there's there's two risk factors associated with uh, Starship. One is technical risk. What if it fails? What if something seriously goes wrong and the thing comes down on Brownsville and kills 50 people? Okay. Uh, you know, um, you know, things could happen in aerospace. Things did happen in aviation. Um, and there could be a bad accident that really knocks the thing dead. Okay. 
Now, I actually don't think that's going to happen. I, I do think we'll probably have some more fight failures, but they're not going to kill anybody. Um, the, um, you know, it's just going to take a few more launches before they get the thing to work properly. But if something really bad happened, that could knock SpaceX out. Uh, the other thing is, frankly, Musk, uh, who is personally a risk taker and not just with respect to uh, Starship or other businesses, with respect to his dealings with the political establishment, the Securities and Exchange Commission, and so forth. And um, the he could do something stupid uh, that gets him prosecuted. Um, there certainly, uh, he's made a fair number of enemies um, and that have their knives out for him. And, um, you know, he skates close to the edge of the ice. And if he yeah. skates off the edge of the ice, that could could bring the whole thing down. And now if that was to occur, though, if either of those were to occur, okay, um, I think we're still making it to Mars because what Musk has done is he's proven the point that it is possible for a well-led entrepreneurial team to do things like this, to do things that, frankly, before this, it was only thought that the governments of superpowers could do and do them in uh, one third the time at one tenth the cost um, and even do things they had said were impossible altogether. And as a result, there are people copying him. There's five companies in China right now that are working on creating a knockoff of the Falcon 9. Falcon 9 is an extremely successful vehicle, reusable first stage, expendable upper stage, uh, I think Musk this year is is Falcon 9 launches are more than the whole rest of the world put together. Um, and the number of satellites SpaceX has launched using them, plus the heavies, is more than the whole rest of the world. The majority of, 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 of satellites in Earth orbit right now are now SpaceX satellites. And people are looking at this and they say, we got to have this. And uh, as I say, the Chinese companies, but also America, I mean, blue will eventually fly, but also there's companies like Relativity, uh, Rocket Lab, Stoke Space uh, that, I mean, their designs are a bit different, but fundamentally it's the same idea and they've got investors funding them and they're going to happen. They're not as far along as SpaceX is. So if SpaceX uh, fails, it will add some years to the schedule that I, I said, but it's going to happen. You don't, you don't actually, I mean, what is the likelihood in your opinion of SpaceX failing? Truly. Well, I, I can't put a number on it because uh, Musk, uh, I, I think that if he doesn't screw up with these other adventures, uh, the outside of SpaceX, so then I think SpaceX is a sure bet that it will succeed. Well, not sure, nothing sure, 90%. Okay. Uh, to me, the greater risk, uh, I mean, uh, you know, Musk has said some things that are sympathetic to uh, Putin's war uh, on Ukraine, which is a war on the West. And if this thing becomes more clearly a war on the West, and if he sticks with Putin, um, it'll be the end of it. Uh, it's extremely unwise, uh, just even from the point of view of his business interests, this flirting with Putin. Um, it has, you know, two years ago, the US military was willing to say, what do we need Lockheed Martin for? We got SpaceX. Hey, they're one quarter the price. Let's just do this. Okay. Now they're saying, oh, we need to have an alternative here. Okay. And, th and then there's other things. Uh, that that he he does that are risky or frankly unwise and i mean the whole twitter thing is a huge waste of his time and energy um and um they're investigating him because of alleged political uh, uh biases of the twitter uh or x as it's called um uh, as he calls it nobody else does but the um uh but in any case uh, I really hope he sells Twitter off, gets out of that. That's a huge waste of his time and energy. And it is, I mean, he had such tremendous goodwill across the political spectrum between SpaceX and Tesla. Okay. Um, you know, left, right, or center, everybody loved Musk. 
and now he's made enemies all over the place, and um, and this threatens the endeavor. Um, it, it's not wise. Now, you know, Musk is is uh, fast on his feet, and um, um, he's gotten into risky uh, situations before. I mean, certainly politically, uh, the major SpaceX companies tried to murder SpaceX in its cradle by maneuvering to deny him any access to launch sites. He managed to outmaneuver them. Yeah. Um, he had so, to go pretty far away. <laughs> okay. Um, but so he's not uh, helpless in the contact sport of politics, but still um, he's taking a lot of risks outside of SpaceX that in my view are unnecessary. And I can only hope that they don't um, uh, destroy him. Well, I think I, I would wonder um, if some of my subscribers and followers would say, okay, we don't want this discussion to get political, but is there, can we not separate the two? Is it right. too- Well, well I, I'm not trying to get, I mean, while I certainly disagree with him on his stand on Ukraine, my my point that I'm making here is not that he is, although I believe he is wrong on Ukraine, that's not the, the point that I'm asking the viewers to believe. I'm simply pointing out to them that he's taking some risks here, and there's no question about that, uh, that are not necessary um, for SpaceX and which could uh, derail SpaceX. Well, what do you think about the fact that SpaceX has, you know, Gwen Shotwell as the president, Kathy Leaders recently moved down or is working, you know, at Starbase also overseeing operations. Does that help as a buffer? Well, sure. No, I mean, look, Musk, I mean, one of Musk's great strength is his ability to recruit a superb team. And that's everyone from Gwen Shotwell down to every mechanic that works for him. Okay. He has the best a uh, rocket team, uh, I was about to say since Von Braun, I would say he's the best rocket team ever, period. Um, and he has a tremendous business team. So he's got talent. This is not a one person show. Uh, and obviously these people that you've named are invaluable. I mean, look, SpaceX, you don't join SpaceX to have a nice lifestyle, okay? <laughs> Um, you know, SpaceX, you join SpaceX if you want to be part of the revolution. Right. And the, the, you know, you joined SpaceX, you should expect to get a call at three o'clock in the morning. We need you in Boca Chica by 5 a.m. I mean, the, 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 this is what's happening. If you, if you want the, the, the hot tub, go work for Blue. Okay. The, um, you know, and, 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 and you can have a nice, relaxed career doing interesting things. Uh, but, um, you know, uh, I um, envy the young people who, they're mostly very young, the SpaceX team, right. uh, who've got what it takes to do that. And, you know, I know that some of them, they're doing it, they're willing to do it, but some of them say, gee, you know, this is just nutty. Uh, I said to one of them uh, a year ago, uh, you're living the dream. You are living the dream. When you are, you know, 40 or 50 or 60, you're going to look back on this time as the greatest time of your life. The wake up calls at 3 a.m., all of that, the, 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 the you know, whatever it is, um, the crazy stuff. This is the dream. Okay. And, uh, you know, if someone watching this show is a young engineer, uh, just about to get out of college maybe this year, and you want to really do something with your aerospace or, well, frankly, any engineering degree fits in with this because they need uh, electrical engineers, mechanical engineers, civil engineers, even, even um, um, ocean engineers, frankly, uh, the, 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 you know, go apply to SpaceX. It's the best thing right. you can do. Absolutely. Well, and you bring me to uh, bringing up the Elon Musk biography by Walter Isaacson. He talks about one of the employees, uh, you know, getting burnt out, saying, I've, I've had enough. This is too crazy of a life. He leaves SpaceX. 
works another job, which is much slower paced, quite boring, and then decides to go back to SpaceX because even though it's a crazy hectic job, very dynamic, he'd rather have that than be bored. So it really is, um, I'm sure, uh, a very memorable experience and, and really making an impact on our future. Right. And it may be even, um, I've never asked him about this, but I would suspect that Musk does this on purpose for the purpose of getting the best, that he doesn't want just the people who, okay, I can be an engineer and, and I will have a reasonably good salary and a reasonably good lifestyle and interesting work. He wants the hardcore people. That's yeah. who he wants. And, uh, you know, he's not recruiting for the army. He's recruiting for the 101st Airborne or the special forces or, you know, the, 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 that's who he wants. He wants the few, the proud, whatever, or the Marines say. Okay, he wants the shock troops. And so he puts them through a little bit uh, and possibly on purpose in order to filter them out that way. Right. Well, and you knew Elon pretty early on. Um, do you think that he has changed who he is? Yeah, he has changed over the years. Um, he has. Um, in some ways for the better, in some ways for the worse. Success changes people. Um, and, uh, you know, I was asked by Time Magazine, they interviewed me for the, um, when he was man of the year in 2021. Uh, and they asked me about various things and I have various comments scattered throughout the article, but they also gave me the final word, which was they asked me uh, and, and I had a, a, a generally a very positive take on Musk. But uh, they asked me, if he fails, why will he fail? Okay, if, if it proves that he does fail, why, what will be the cause of that? And I said, if he should fail, it will be for the same reason that Napoleon failed in Russia, which was that he had succeeded every time before that. OK, you know, there were all these French generals who told Napoleon, why don't we just take Poland and call it good? We don't need to go to Moscow. We'll just take Poland. We'll liberate it. The Poles will love us forever for freeing them from the Russians and, and we'll have won the war. And Napoleon said, well, you know, you people always gave me advice to be cautious before. And you were always wrong. The bold path was always the right path. I was always right. You were always wrong. And he was off to Moscow where he lost his army. Uh, and if Musk should fail, it will be because of that. There's a lot in common he has with Napoleon. He, like Napoleon, he is a genius. He is. Uh, but he also has extreme hubris, which has gotten greater and greater the more he has succeeded. And, um, and at this point, um, as I said, he's taken some unnecessary risks. He's made a lot of unnecessary enemies. Uh, and, uh, and if he fails, that will be why he fails, because he just said, you know, screw it, I can do anything, and didn't, uh, wasn't measured in what he tried to do. I imagine it's much harder to be Elon and live the life that he lives than than we realize. Um, and I, I do want to go back to talking about Starship for a little bit as we talk to looking forward to Mars. Um, I talk about Starship not only because I'm primarily SpaceX focused on my channel, but is there really anyone else that's even close to to, to talking about? Am I missing anyone? No, there's no one close. Uh, but there are people who now have um, gotten the idea, and um, while they're not close, they're following the same trail. Right. Okay. And, and I'm so, playing this video. This is from eight years ago now. Isn't that hard to believe? This video was from eight years ago. This really focuses on the point-to-point -point transport aspect of Starship, which obviously we're not there yet. Um, but we're also talking with you today about uh, using Starship to get to Mars. Right. 
Well, the point to point is very important, okay, because it's, it would represent a huge market for Starship type vehicles. Okay, and I say Starship type vehicles because once again, there'll be the Chinese knockoffs and I bet your rocket lab will have something that can more or less do the same kind of thing uh, and, and some others. Uh, it's just going to take him a little longer to get there. He's shown them what to do. Okay. And uh, now, and then there'll be a market for them. And now here's the thing. The fact that there's going to be used, uh, uh, reusable launch vehicles means there's going to be used launch vehicles. That hasn't been a thing up till now. You can't buy a used Saturn V or a used Atlas or something. If they're used, they are gone, okay, by definition, okay? But there's going to be used Starship-type vehicles. There'll be a large market on it. And just like you can buy a used car for one-tenth the cost of a new car um, or less, um, the, the, it's going to be possible to buy used launch vehicles. Uh, I mean, think about what that means. It means that groups of people will be able to pick up a used starship somewhere, say from Astrolinea Mexicana or somebody who's, you know, done with it. They'll take it and they'll go off to Mars. Okay. The, um, okay, you know, Musk told me that he uh, uh, could build a starship, that is the upper stage, the part that would actually go to Mars, for $10 million. That means that either he or somebody else, if he doesn't adopt a, a, a business model that involves selling them, there'll be someone else who does, would be happy to sell them for 20. And that means you could probably pick up a used one sooner or later for two. Now, the thing uh, houses 100 people to Mars. Uh, $2 million divided by 100 people is $20,000 each. So if you and your, say, let's say you're a member of a, a tight-knit group, a religious sect, something that you want to have your own place that, that where you can make your own world, $20,000 each, pitch in, let's buy this starship, go to Mars. I mean, the uh, and keep it there. Okay, not, not buying the ride, buying the ship. Uh, right. And, and then it's starter housing on Mars. That's uh, and, and after they, they dig their tunnels and whatnot, create permanent housing on Mars, that thing is available uh, to go mine asteroids with or something. Um, the, 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 so, you know, th this is what is opening the way. Um, reusable launch vehicles means there will be used launch vehicles, which means there's going to be cheap launch vehicles. Well, I'm, I'm laughing because the cost of a zero G flight is, you know, almost 15 grand in most cases. <laughs> oh, so geez. That is crazy to think about. Um, and thank you for another super chat from El Hungaro. He is enjoying this interview. And um, we do have another request uh, to, to talk about who you are, Dr. Zubrin. What is your credentials? I, I think you can probably tell people better than I can, um, if you don't mind just letting people know who you are. OK, well, um... I have um, a bachelor's in applied mathematics. I have master's degrees in aeronautics and astronautics and nuclear engineering, and I have a doctorate in nuclear engineering. And I have uh, 35 years industry experience. Um, and uh, I've written 14 books. I am the author of over 20 granted patents. Uh, I have a lot of experience. Um, so those are my formal credentials, um, but I think what I'm best known for is being quite uh, bold in saying what I think. Uh, I, I'm, you know, uh, some of the things I've said in this interview already may have uh, not pleased Elon Musk. Um, some probably did. Uh, but I just say what I think. And in particular, with respect to NASA, uh, I've very much said what I think, for instance, about things like the Lunar Orbit Gateway, which I regard as a Lunar Orbit toll booth. I think it is a completely stupid plan. Um, it is a waste of the taxpayers' money. It's going to make lunar missions harder to do because NASA is going to make people use it. Otherwise, it will be clear that it's useless. And in fact, if you take their current mission architecture, which involves using Starship to land on the moon, it requires a lot of refueling flights to get it to the moon and back. If you go through the gateway, it requires a total of 14 Starship launches. If you don't go through the gateway, you can do it with 10. So 
having the gateway makes it harder. It's like somebody, if you wanted to fly from New York to uh, Los Angeles saying, well, that's fine, but you have to go through Mexico City. So why do I need to go to Mexico City? Well, we've just built a new terminal in Mexico City and we want people to use it. Say, but it's a lot easier if I just go to Los Angeles. Say, sorry. Um, the um, So that, that that's what the gateway is good for. Nothing, less than nothing. Anyway, so that's my brand. I tell it as I see it. And, and I think we all appreciate that. Um, so we do have some people requesting that I talk about our next topic and I'm going to put up the video. Is there sound in this YouTube video talking about MTI? Well, there could be, it depends. I mean, there was in the original one. Let's see what okay. you got. Let's see what I got. And um, this is not MIT, this is MTI. So pay close attention. We can do the terrestrial inventors colony now whereas we're not in position to do it on Mars. So why not start such a Mars Technology Institute on Earth now? Well, why not? So that's exactly what we're going to do. The Mars Technology Institute is going to pioneer the technologies needed for Mars settlement. It's an initial effort. Uh, we're gonna actually focus in the biotech area for a, a, a couple of reasons. One is the reason uh, that I gave implied earlier, which is we're going to do our invention where the money is. The second is that it is, in fact, the showstopper for um, a Mars city. Food is the showstopper for a Mars city. But beyond biotech, there's other areas. There's energy. There's a fusion. And, and then fusion uh, will enable not only large amounts of power on Mars, but also uh, for fusion powered rockets. And then there's AI and robotics, but this is an important area. Now, this is also an area where there's a lot of money to be found, but I'm trying to define a research area in it that uh, specifically meets our needs that is not being addressed by current research in this area. The MTI is going to be a nonprofit. It is already established as a 501c3. We are looking for donations because this institute needs to become self-financing. The idea here is to create both an engine of invention and an engine of finance that can both finance further invention and if it is truly successful, finance the human settlement of Mars. The road to Mars goes through the lab. We will invent our way to Mars. Ad Martem Innovando. Okay. All right. So, so you see, we don't we don't use elevator music. Yeah. No, I actually like the music choice a lot. I was going to compliment that. That that was All good. Right. All right. Beethoven's third. Yeah. <laughs> so um so I I must have missed this. Is this recent? Yes, it is. Uh, that video that you just saw was launched with our crowdfunding campaign, which has been going on for about a week now. Uh, okay. And people can find it at marstechnology.institute. Okay. And we've got a crowdfunding campaign going on to launch the MTI. And, okay, so here's the idea. Okay. People ask me, what is going to be the export of a Mars colony? Okay. You know, people, the lunar advocates sometimes talk, they're going to export helium-3, and asteroid people say they're going to export platinum. What's Mars going to export? Okay. And my answer to that is Mars is going to export inventions. Okay. Right. Um, because a Mars colony is going to be a group of technologically adept people in a frontier environment where they're going to have to innovate in a number of key areas, some of which I named in that movie, including uh, biotech, energy, and artificial intelligence. Uh, and I'll, I'll come back to why those are three very important areas. Um, and uh, those inventions, while necessary for them on Mars, will have tremendous commercial property uh, possibilities on Earth. And so they will license them on Earth and um, make money from licensing those uh, inventions. And that will be used to pay for what Mars needs to import. So we're going to export inventions and then import stuff. Um, 
and uh, inventions are the easiest thing to export across interplanetary space. All you need is a radio. Uh, and that's what we're going to do. So I have a new book that's going to come out in February. It's called The New World on Mars. Okay. Uh, what can we create on the red planet? And this book basically takes the position that it will soon be possible for people to go to Mars, either through Starship or through its competitors. And uh, then the question is, what will we create once we were there? So I'm looking explicitly at the problems of Mars settlement. Now, uh, and, and including not just technical questions, but also social and political questions. Now, with respect to those latter, I don't try to prescribe a utopia. I rather take the point of view that there's going to be lots of Mars city states founded by people with very different ideas on what the social and political system should be. And the right one will be chosen by natural selection. Okay, that is the one that attracts the most immigrants. Okay, the one that is the most inventive. That that is the one that is going to outcompete the rest, or the several that will outcompete the rest, and become the prevalent form of human society on Mars. But they also look at the technical issues, and I found a number of very important technical issues that need to be addressed. Um, you see, for instance, if you take food. Now, food is not a fundamental technical issue for a Mars expedition. A human mission to Mars can just bring its food. And it actually turns out it's about the fifth largest thing in the mass manifest of the mission. Now, it's not in the noise, but it's not a mission driver at all. You can just bring the food, okay? It's number five uh, after propellant, water, structure, and critical life support systems. Uh, the, 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 um, uh, but, uh, Mars colony is a different story altogether. Okay. Right. It's one thing to feed five people for two and a half years. It's another thing to feed 50,000 people, um, on an ongoing basis. Obviously you cannot import the food. Now, uh, you say, well, okay, let's just set up greenhouses and grow the food on Mars. Well, that works if we're talking a Mars base of maybe 50 people or a hundred people that greenhouses and there are people like interstellar labs, Barbara Velvisi's company that are, are doing good work in that area. Um, so that's fine for a Mars base, but it, the numbers do not work when we start talking about a Mars city state, even a 50,000 person Mars city state, let alone a 5 million person Mars metropolis. Okay because uh, the, the amount of, of land that you need is just much too large. And if you were to try to illuminate us, if you're trying to do this in tunnels and LED lighting, or even supplement Mars natural lighting with LEDs, you're talking about gigawatts of power for the lighting. So, and the problem there, okay, if you wanna know, is the inefficiency of photosynthesis. A an Iowa cornfield, okay, uh, can uh, support around 10 people per acre, okay? Uh, and so you're gonna have 5,000 acres to support 50,000 people? It's ridiculous. Uh, the, 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 and the, the problem is the inefficiency of photosynthesis. You see photosynthesis at the level of the chloroplast, first of all, is only 4% efficient at turning light into uh, um, carbohydrate energy. And at the level of the cornfield, it's 0.2% efficiency if we're turning it into corn and 0.02% efficiency if we're turning it into meat. And the the and that's just unacceptable. On the other hand, you have chemical engineering processes that are typically 50% efficient um, or something like that, 30%, 60%, that range. Nobody does chemical engineering processes that are 0.02% efficient. It's just not how, what we do. And so we've identified certain possibilities incorporating a combination of chemical engineering and advanced biotech to be able to create synthetic meat with end-to-end uh, 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 -end deficiencies over 10%, which is to say almost a thousand times doing it with traditional agriculture. Another problem you have on Mars is a tremendous labor shortage. Um, even if you had 50,000 people on Mars, that's nothing like the billions you have on Earth. On Earth, if you need someone who knows how to do something, you can just pick up the phone and that person exists somewhere. Um, on Mars, once again, I keep coming back to 50,000 people 
uh, as my notional Mars colony, because um, that's the size of Renaissance Florence, for example. You can have a real city with 50,000 people. It's right. hard to have millions of people in one location on Mars because you can't have a million person city until you have long distance transport to be able to bring material resources from very far away to a central point. So, you know, before the modern age, there were very few cities uh, that had a million people. Okay, the Rome, Imperial Rome had a million people, uh, but it was the only city in the Roman Empire that did. Uh, you know, so forth. Uh, major medieval city, medieval Paris, 80,000 people, um, so forth. So anyway, 50,000 people, fine. Um, anyway, uh, you don't have the division of labor there to do all the different things you need to do. So we're going to want artificial intelligence. We're working on uh, artificial intelligence technology that would allow almost anyone to do almost anything. Right. Okay. That's the technology that we're working on. And the uh, and then energy, no fossil fuels on Mars. The wind is thin, solar energy is weak. Uh, uh, nuclear will work, but we're not going to want nuclear reactors like the pressurized water reactors that uh, are almost all the nuclear reactors on Earth that only get 1% of the energy out of the uranium. We're going to want to get 90% or else go to fusion. Deuterium is five times as common on Mars as it is on Earth. Um, you know, that's the ideal energy source for Mars. So we're looking at possibilities there. And what the MTI is going to do, you see, we're going to develop these ideas to first order, do uh, basic demonstrations of fundamental feasibility, and then create business plans around specific technical concepts that we identify as extremely promising in these areas, recruit a team, write the business plan, and then spin that off as a for-profit company for people to invest in, okay? And so for MTI, we need hundreds of thousands of dollars. These companies themselves will need tens of millions to get going, but it will be possible to raise tens of millions because you've got the profit mode of working for you at that point. Um, I should say, however, that anyone who donates $5,000 or more to MTI will get an invitation to participate pro rata in the first round stock offerings of the spinoff companies. And the first round is when you have the most favorable stock price. Um, the, um, so, you know, if you want to donate to MTI, it'd be a great time to do it. End of the year right. is a tax deductible donation if you're an American. Uh, and if you, Donate $100, we'll send you an autographed hardcover first edition copy of the book when it comes out early next year. Uh, if you donate $1,000, you will get a plaque as a, a founder of the MTI. Uh, and also, we received a huge donation of books from the Univelt company on uh, that we have a library of all their books about Mars. And if you donate 1000 or more, in addition to my book, you'll get the whole Univelt Mars Library, um, which includes all the proceedings of the famous Case for Mars conferences that occurred in the 80s uh, that led the way to the Mars Society. Um, and so you can be a founder for a thousand bucks. And then at 5,000 or more, yes, we give you a pro rata invitation to participate as an investor in the spinoff companies that we're going to have. Well, it looks like in just a few days, you know, you've raised over $45,000. And also just a few days ago, I haven't covered this yet on my channel, but there was a headline that Elon has recently committed to contributing $100 million to create a primary, primary and secondary school in Austin, Texas, focused on STEM. So he's also a Mars advocate. What would it mean if he were to donate to MTI? Well, it'd be great. I would certainly welcome a, a major donation from him to MTI. And, um, you know, uh, we'd like to raise a million dollars uh, for the MTI itself. Uh, and uh, Elon, if you're listening to this, we'd love to have you as the, the donate donor who, who makes that happen. And that would get this thing off and going. And we would uh, then create teams to establish for-profit investable businesses in a variety of areas that are absolutely necessary if we're going to make humanity multi-planetary. The problem with raising food, uh, 
within space colonies is true not just for Mars, but for the it's even harder for the moon or asteroids. Uh, so the technology we're talking about developing here, while our focus is on Mars, is also essential for enabling human space settlement anywhere. Well, I do want to get to a couple questions before we wrap up. We have about 15 minutes, but just while we're still on the topic, one of my longtime listeners, Dana, who can't watch right now, wanted to know, will MTI or another institute be developing a training curriculum for settlers, damage control, life support, radiation procedures, et cetera? Well, uh, the MTI is going to focus on uh, fundamental technologies. Right. Uh, now, uh, as opposed to uh, astronaut training, as you know, the Mars Society has two stations, one in the American desert, the Mars Desert Research Station, in which we have a crew from Purdue University is in it right now, and our Arctic station, the uh, Flashline Mars Arctic Research Station on Devon Island, where we practice Mars missions and try to figure out what's likely to go wrong, what's the right way to deal with it, uh, what's the most efficient way to do field exploration. So yes, dealing both with emergency situations and also general operations, we do that kind of research there. Okay, great. And I do want to get to this question from Jesse. Sorry that we've had to wait a little bit, but I wanted to stay on topic for a little bit. He wants to know, are you happy with the general design of the Starship stack as it stands right now? Well, it seems like a pretty good design to me. The one thing that I would do is I would also develop a mini starship uh, comparable to the, the upper stage starship that you see, but designed to fit as the upper stage of a Falcon 9. And uh, so that it would be about one fifth the size of the big starship that is currently there. And this could operate together with Falcon 9s and be a fully reusable medium launch system. Okay. But also you could put it inside of the current starship fully fueled lift it to orbit and then it could shoot itself right off to mars and that's the to, to me a preferred vehicle for doing mars exploration because you'd only need to make about one-fifth the propellant in order to send it home so it, you know initial exploration missions don't need to send a hundred people to mars and even when you colonize mars it's not going to be very often that you're sending 100 people back to Earth. Um, so Starship is oversized for an Earth return vehicle. Um, and um, so you can do it with Starship. But, you know, it's like if you have an RV, is it what you want to use to drive around town? You can, uh, but it's not the best vehicle for that. Right. So I, I think that... Um, and I've had this discussion with Musk uh, that it would greatly improve the operational um, efficiency of the Starship mission architecture to also have a mini Starship. And I think we talked about that last time too. So um, hopefully, you know, we get some feedback sometime from Elon about that. Ross has a great question for you. What do you think the role of SpaceX should be for Mars missions to provide a transportation service for crew and cargo or to actually lead the mission on the surface of Mars? I'd be happy with either role. Uh, the, look, if NASA is game to contribute the other parts of the mission as uh, I'd like to see it do, uh, I, I, you know, I, I'd like that the Mars mission not just be a SpaceX project, but one that the entire American people and even allied nations are participating in. Uh, to me, that would be the preferred mode. But if NASA won't play ball, then I'm all for SpaceX doing it in itself. Right. Um, oh, and thank you. Wow, we just got a, another super chat. So thank you to everyone who's feeling generous today. Astro Van Tuckett also enjoying our conversation here. Um, Zap Fan wants to know what nuclear reactor does Dr. Zubrin have confidence will be ready and get used on the moon and Mars? Okay. Well, you see, if we're talking about just powering a, a lunar base or a Mars base or a Mars expedition, uh, there's any number of choices that one could use. Uh, there was uh, the SP-100 design that was um, 
there was a program to develop it in the late 80s, early 90s. It got killed by the Clinton administration, but it certainly would have worked. There's other designs that people have. There's designs that could be developed off of the current killer power program. Um, and these would all be acceptable for a Mars expedition. Okay. The, or you could even, frankly, develop things developed uh, off the basis of the pressurized water reactor, frankly, that powers uh, the civilian nuclear power plants and nuclear submarines. Um, you could do it. Um, would work too. But for a Mars colony, we want to go beyond this, okay? If we're doing nuclear reactors, we want to at least do fusion, uh, excuse me, breeder reactors. Um, see, uranium that you find is 99.3% uranium-238, 0.7% uranium-235. In other words, slightly less than 1% of the uranium is uranium-235, which is the fissile fuel, okay? It's the stuff that actually you get energy out of in a nuclear reactor. And what they do is they refine the uranium to bring it up to about 3% uranium-235 before they put it in the reactor, sometimes 4 or 5%, okay? And then they burn that. But of the uranium that you've mined, the total amount of the fuel you're actually using is only 1% of what you mined out of the ground, okay? Um, and now, however, uh, the uranium-238, uh, when it absorbs neutrons, it turns into plutonium-239, which is also fissile, and which is, is as good a fuel as uranium-235. Uh, and so this is what suggested the idea of breeder reactors, where you, as you run your reactor, you can start turning this inactive uranium-238 into an active fuel as you go. Now, actually, in an ordinary nuclear reactor, a small amount of that actually happens. Uh, in other words, some of the energy released in a common nuclear reactor is actually being released from the plutonium, not just the original uranium. But in total, you're getting about 1% of the energy. Um, in a proper breeder reactor, almost all the uranium-238 is turned into uranium two, uh, into plutonium-239, and you end up getting not 1% of the energy, but 90%, okay? Almost 100 times as much energy from a bunch of mined uh, fuel. Now, why aren't we doing it? Okay, people have been aware of this, and actually the first a uh, breeder reactor test took place in the early 50s, if you can believe it, uh, and it was successful. Uh, but the if you go to a utility and say, why don't you build a breeder reactor instead of this old-fashioned pressurized water reactor, you know, that was invented by Admiral Rickover for the Nautilus, why are you still using this old thing? And they would say, well, because even with this reactor, the fuel cost is only 5% of our total cost. The rest of the cost is the cost of building the reactor and the interest on that expense, okay? And so why should we care about making our fuel more efficient when 95% of our cost is elsewhere? And furthermore, if we try to build a breeder reactor, we have enough problems getting the Nuclear Regulatory Commission to approve uh, a, a pressurized water reactor, and they've seen 500 of them already, we go to them with a new kind of reactor that will take decades before they'll license us. And that will add much more to our costs than anything we'd save by making the fuel cheaper. So that's not happening on Earth. But on Mars, okay, if you're bringing the fuel from Earth, it'd be really a good thing to cut the amount you have to bring by 100, okay? And if you're mining it on Mars, uh, you're probably having to mine uranium from a place that's near your city, which is not likely to be the best uranium ore on Mars. You know, on Earth, you know, we have a global transportation network. And if the fuel has to come from the Congo or someplace, so be it. We can get it and get it here. Um, and uh, but, you know, imagine that the nuclear reactor in near Chicago has to get its uranium from someplace near Chicago. OK, now there are places near Chicago or New York City for that matter, where there is uranium. Common granite 
is um, two parts per million uranium and uh, eight parts per million thorium. And actually, if you could extract that uranium and thorium from the granite, uh, a kilogram of granite has as much energy as 100 kilograms of oil. Okay, but it is expensive to make your fuel that way. It's much easier to find a place where instead of being 10 parts per million good stuff, it's, you know, 100,000 parts per million. Uh, but that requires global transport, which we have on Earth, but don't on Mars. So we're going to want breeder reactors on Mars. And we'll want reactors that can not just breed uranium, as I just described, but also thorium, which can be done as well. Uh, and thorium is four times as common as uranium. So that'd be a good thing. Uh, and then finally, fusion. You know, people fooling around with fusion on Earth, but there's no urgency to it because we got all these fossil fuels, as well as a number of other ways to make energy. And um, the, the, but Mars, there are no fossil fuels. And uh, well, the, the uranium poses the issues that I just described, whereas deuterium is found in all Martian water everywhere and five times as plentiful as it is on Earth. So the Martians are going to be heavily driven to want to develop fusion reactors. Um, the You won't be able to say, what do we need fusion for? We'll just burn natural gas. No. Um, the, 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 say, this this is what we need. We're going to do this. Um, so breeder reactors and fusion reactors. That's what uh, we need for a Mars colony. That was a very <laughs> thorough answer. OK, breeder reactors. And thank you. Robert is enjoying this, our chat. Uh, he thanks Ellie and Robert for the chat. We have less than five minutes left. So um, I don't know if you want to answer one more question or just kind of wrap up your thoughts. Well, um, I, I do want to say a couple of things. OK. Number one, first of all, with respect to nuclear, as I mentioned earlier, I do have a doctorate in nuclear engineering, although most of my work has been in astronautics. But I did write a book called The Case for Nukes, and it's on sale on Amazon right now. And if you're interested in nuclear energy, just go there. It's the best book that you can buy about nuclear power. Uh, and it's either paper or Kindle, however you like. Um, secondly, uh, I have another book that's coming out in February. And in fact, you can buy them on Amazon now, or better yet, donate $100 to the MTI and get an autographed first hardcover edition uh, and know that you have uh, contributed to this. This is historic, okay? At the MTI is going to make history. Uh, and so I'm inviting people to really be a creator here to help us make history, uh, to help us launch this thing. Um, and get the book at the same time. And then finally, most broadly, um, I just want to say, look, you know, a lot of things going on in the world right now. A lot of things. And a lot of them are pretty important at the moment. But if you ask any American what happened in the year 1492, they would tell you, well, that was the year that Columbus sailed, right? And frankly, if you ask any Mexican or Argentine or anybody in the Western Hemisphere with even a moderate education, that's what they would answer. Uh, and it's true, but that wasn't the only thing that happened in 1492. In 1492, England and France signed a peace treaty. If there had been newspapers in 1492, which there were not, but if there had been, if there had been the Washington Post or something, that would have been the headline, not Christopher Columbus. Okay. Uh, in 1492, the Borgias took over the papacy, okay, most powerful political institution in the European world. That would have been a big headliner, okay? How many people know about that today? I know about it. I'm a history buff. Okay, <laughs> Lorenzo de' Medici, the great patron of the Renaissance in Italy, died in 1492. Um, the, you know, a lot of things happened in 1492, but we remember Columbus. Right. So what are people going to remember 500 years from now? I think 500 years from now, only history buffs will know who Vladimir Putin was or Donald Trump, okay, uh, or Joe Biden, um, the, or who Taylor Swift was, um, you know, or you name it. All the things that are the big headliners right now uh, will not be remembered 500 years from now. What will be remembered? What we do to make humanity a spacefaring species. 
this the Columbuses of this time is the people who will be remembered. Musk will probably be remembered. There's a chance I might be remembered. Um, and the other people who contribute significantly to make this happen, they will be the ones who remember. This time will be remembered because this is when we first set sail for other worlds. So if you're listening to this, and especially if you're a young person listening to this who has the bulk of your career in front of you right now, you're tremendously privileged. You are present at the creation. You're present at the creation of the MTI and you're present at the creation of humanity as a spacefaring species. So take advantage of it. And one last thing, um, the Mars Society is planning to have its next convention uh, in August in Seattle. We haven't yet found the exact place, but keep your eyes for, out for it when we make the public announcement. And I hope you see there. Seattle, by the way, is an absolutely fantastic place to be in August. It does not rain in Seattle in August, and the mountains are beautiful. It is an awesome place to be. I've spent many Augusts there, and I would love to go to that conference, um, maybe even present. So thank you for letting us know about that. Um, and a lot of people have enjoyed this talk. Zubrin and Musk are taking us to Mars. We have great interview, Ellie. Um, thank you for your life's work, Dr. Zubrin. We stand on the shoulders of giants. So we really do appreciate you taking this time with us today. You've made our Monday much more exciting and interesting. Um, and so thank you so much for, for sharing some of your Monday with us. All right. It's been a pleasure, Ellie. Awesome. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone who tuned in. Okay.